So Tina, remind us what's your area of expertise? Who do you do you normally treat and for what conditions? Okay, well, normally I um, see a lot of menopausal women uh, because I'm a menopause specialist. But five years ago, I diagnosed mast cell activation and histamine intolerance in my youngest daughter who became extremely ill. And um, it was a sort of mystery illness and nobody could come up with a diagnosis. So I felt it was my responsibility to work out what was going on. And, um, and I diagnosed her with mast cell activation um, and histamine intolerance and then started learning all about the condition, which is a very newly described condition. And that's why um, it was difficult to find some help for her. And then I couldn't help but keep diagnosing it in other people that I was seeing for in my uh, for my in my contraception clinics or in my menopause clinics and i realized that actually i was probably diagnosing four or five six people a week with the condition and they had previously had medically unexplained symptoms um, and what we describe mus which is you know they had ibs they had chronic fatigue they had um they had hypermobility um they had headaches chronic headaches urticaria skin rashes food intolerances, all of these kind of symptoms, um, which hadn't previously been diagnosed as anything. When I then saw them and asked their full history, I was finding actually they fit with the MCAS picture. And so I was diagnosing these people and then helping a lot of people to realize what their issues were and to start improving their health and their symptoms. So that was happening. And then along came COVID and, um, and we've started talking about the, all the symptoms that patients with long COVID were experiencing. And you and I both said to each other, actually, that this seems to be a lot of the MCAS picture. And these patients have got the fatigue, the headaches, the aches and pains, um, the insomnia, the anxiety, and all the symptoms that I was so used to seeing in all my uh, mast cell activation histamine intolerance patients for five years and it seemed too much of a coincidence that the profile was the same. So then you started seeing people with long Covid and treating them, so what's been happening, what have you found? Okay so first of all I actually asked people to download an app called People With and that's written as one word because we wanted to look and see if uh, the theory was correct that their profile was similar to mast cell activation patients and uh, nearly 2,000 patients downloaded the app and started putting in their symptoms which was really helpful um, and we could see that actually their symptom profiles were exactly the same as patients with mast cell activation and hyperstimulation of the mast cells. So, um, so that was very, a very useful exercise. And then I was really interested to start seeing long COVID patients because I wanted to know what their histories were like and what's, you know, what they were experiencing. And, um, and on, on the app, it showed that they, on average, had at least nine symptoms each. I mean, you know, this is, these people are really troubled um, with their health, it's terrible. And often a lot of them are very previously pretty healthy people, you know, not athlete, athletes and, you know, fit and healthy, normal people. And they were finding that instead of recovering from this virus, they were, they felt like they recovered often. And then they would take a, a sort of dive, nose dive, and all the symptoms would come back and more new symptoms would develop. Um, and this went on for months and months and months. So I started seeing the patients and the really interesting thing has been that every single long COVID patient I've seen has got a previous history suggestive that they have had oversensitive mast cells all their lives you know they've got histories of IBS or very strange symptoms that they've had that no one's been able to diagnose and explain um, so uh, from funny rashes that appear and disappear as quickly as they come to, um, to, to insomnia and anxiety and panic attacks to dizzy spells and um, sort of fainting attacks um, uh, etc etc so the, the patients give a very clear clear history of actually having some fun dis fairly dysfunctional mast cells probably the whole of their life and the virus has just seemed to have really exaggerated it and overstimulated them and brought out even more symptoms in them. Yeah I was going to ask you about that are we learning from this that um, the long Covid is a, is a kind of manifestation of 
people's uh, MCAS and histamine intolerance that, that existed already? Do you think that's the most likely thing that's happening or could some people have developed it from, from having this virus? Well, it's, it's very interesting. The virus obviously interacts with the mast cells because the mast cells are a, a big, very important part of our immune system. And um, so in a, in a person who has normal mast cells is going to create a reaction and they will get some inflammation from the infection. But normally I would expect them to get over it quite quickly and to recover and go back to being fit and healthy. But in patients who have, um, who seem to have this hyper stimulation of their mast cells and this propensity to overreact to infections and to any stimuli um, that comes, it, that it sort of attacks their body, then they overreact and create a huge amount of release from the mast cells, which then causes massive inflammation. Now, one of the chemicals that the mast cells release is histamine. And when histamine is released, it causes inflammation and that's its job. It's there to, designed to help us. Um, but when there's too much of it, then you get inflammation in your lungs, in your, uh, in your gut, et cetera, et cetera. It causes lots and lots of issues and symptoms. So, um, so I think that it's been very interesting. I've seen over 30, about 35 now patients with long COVID and we are running some genetic tests on them and we're starting to get the results back. And what's really intriguing is so many of them have a genetic variant, which shows that they overreact to inflammation and they've got this propensity to do that. Now we need to, uh, we're going to write this up in the next few weeks, hopefully, because it's a fascinating finding. So compared to the general population, more, you know, virtually all of them have got this variant. Um, and also an awful lot of them have got histamine issues where they don't metabolize histamine so well. So it's a sort of double whammy really. They overreact to inflammation and then they don't cope with getting rid of the high histamine levels very efficiently. So that's going to mean it's gonna stick around in their bodies and cause more, more symptoms and more, uh, have more of an effect. How are you treating them? What's what's working and what evidence have you got now to show that any treatment is working? So the first thing to say is that most of these patients have been seen by various other specialists who have, you know, they've seen a cardiologist and they've had um, cardiac tests and ECGs and angiograms and all sorts of tests to make sure their hearts are okay. They've seen respiratory doctors and they've had various lung scans, etc. And all of their results are usually completely normal. There might be the odd sign of inflammation, but otherwise they're normal. Um, and then they come to see me and um, they haven't actually been offered any um, treatment as such, uh, so, you know, till, till this point. So one of the first things we do is we discuss what I think is going on. And, um, and I'm not the only one, by the way, who's thinking this. There are a lot of other doctors who see mast cell activation patients uh, globally who are also thinking and finding the same, have the same, same findings. And, um, and they, um, so we, we discuss, I tell them what I think is going on. We discuss their history and what I think was happening in their history and how it's indicative of their mast cells being overstimulated and oversensitive really. And then we talk about how we're going to address it. So it's a very slow process. It's not a quick fix. Um, we have to ask them to go on a low histamine diet because obviously their body is absolutely, has far too much histamine in it. So the last thing you want to do is eat histamine as well. So we have to try and do as low a histamine diet as possible. Not always easy, but definitely worth trying um, and doing. And then um, we give them antihistamines, type one and type two antihistamines, and some a mast cell stabilizer, which can really help to dampen down the reaction of the mast cells. And then also um, various vitamins and minerals, which will help support their liver and their metabolism in getting rid of the histamine and their methylation cycles and so on, because they've got a lot of byproducts and toxins to get rid of. And, um, and gradually they, they do start to feel better. Now, a few people, it's been dramatic and they feel very much better very quickly and they can get back to work and they, you know, they feel great. And in some of them, it's a slow process and that's fairly typical of muscle activation. 
it's um it's a very slow process to calm your mast cells down to replace them with better behaved ones that aren't so sensitive and that whole process takes about six months to replace them all uh and uh, you know and it may be that we can't get rid of all of the symptoms completely however one has to remember that a lot of these patients had symptoms before they had coronavirus um, and many of them give a history of reacting in a similar kind of way to other viruses that they've had maybe not as dramatically but they've had when they get a cold or flu they don't recover as quickly as everyone else in the family and they go on for weeks feeling grotty um, and it can take some time for them to completely recover so for people watching, can you just give um, a rundown of the histamine foods or that are the most common culprits um, yeah. to avoid and any supplements to take and what kind of antihistamine? Mm. Okay, so in our bodies, the, our body is constantly trying to keep histamine in balance um, because it has a lot of good uses, but we don't want too much of it. And when somebody's mast cells have been overstimulated, they're going to have too much histamine. So we do have two enzymes that constantly break down histamine. So one is called DAO and it's mostly in the gut. And the other one is HNMT and is mostly in the, inside the body in the, in the blood. And um, the DAO enzyme is designed um, to reduce the amount of histamine from food that we eat so that it, not too much is absorbed into the body. And there are certain things that you could be drinking that can block your diamine oxidase that you have made. So about 30 to 40 percent of patients don't make sufficient diamine oxidase. And the last thing you want to do if you haven't made enough is to start blocking what you have made. Even if you make good levels, because there's so much histamine around, your DAO may be depleted. So again, you don't want to be having blockers and blockers are tea and coffee, green tea and alcohol. So you want to avoid those as much as possible uh, and just drink water, peppermint tea and some herbal teas, but not green. Um, and then you want to look at your food. So. Um, a lot of people eat tomatoes and avocados and spinach and things which are healthy and of course they are healthy but they're also very high in histamine and so they're often my poor patients they are, are doing as best they can with healthy food and all the rest of it and actually they're really adding to their histamine bucket all the time and making themselves worse and then they can't understand they don't realize it's the food that's making things worse as well so it's um it's difficult so there are certain things that are very high in histamine like like tomatoes and avocados and spinach, um, and then wheat and dairy as well. Um, and then bananas and um, strawberries, raspberries, they're all very high. So, and, and of the nuts, there are only three nuts that have very low histamine and they're Brazil nuts, pistachio nuts and macadamia nuts. So I would ke keep clear of all the rest, but you could have those. Um, and then the fruits that are okay are, because sometimes it's easier to say what is good rather than what is high in histamine. So low in histamine would be blueberries, apples and pears, um, blackberries, um, uh, melon, but not watermelon, um, passion fruit, um, pomegranate, nectarines and peaches and grapes. So that's quite a nice variety, but not bananas, please. Lots of people are eating bananas and they're very high in histamine. What about any um, supplements that you're finding to be helpful oh. in the people that you're treating? Yes, so there are, so vitamin D is very helpful. You want a high dose of vitamin D, 4,000, 5,000 units a day. Vitamin C is very important because it's actually an, an antihistamine. It's a natural antihistamine. Now, vitamin C is uh, water soluble. So when you have some, it goes out of the body very quickly. It's metabolized away. So you do need to take either a slow release vitamin C say a thousand milligrams a day or to have um, it three times a day so that you're a uh, thousand milligrams three times a day for example um, so vitamin d vitamin c vitamin um, niacin vitamin b3 is very important now we found that nad plus which is in the body comes from niacin and the nad plus is one of the critical regulators of our physiology um, and it requires zinc as well to be to do its functions. So literally every second we have billions of cell 
um, me uh, mechanisms going on, uh, biochemical processes going on every second, billions, that include NAD+. So it's very, very important and in high demand. And the coronavirus seems to reduce the NAD plus in our bodies and st steal that and the zinc. Now, the NAD plus, the body makes some for itself as well from tryptophan uh, because it realizes it can't just rely on eating it in the diet. So it actually makes it from tryptophan because it's so important. And the, if our NAD plus levels go down, then the body is going to steal tryptophan, which should be doing other things like making serotonin and melatonin to make some more NAD+. And that makes our serotonin levels go down. And serotonin keeps us happy. It also helps our immune system and it also helps us sleep, our sleep rhythm with the melatonin. So if you, unfortunately, if your serotonin goes down because the tryptophan is busy making NAD+, then um, the mast cells start releasing serotonin into the body, which of course brings us right back to the mast cells that start to become overactive again. I would also take zinc, 15 to 30 milligrams a day, selenium, 100 micrograms a day, or three Brazil nuts, which would be the same, um, and magnesium. And these have all been shown to be helpful. And I certainly find that my patients with long COVID find that that particular mix helpful. I guess people with long COVID really need to understand this is not this is not a quick fix that you can you're going to be prescribed some medication for. It's a change of lifestyle. It's a change of diet, and it will take some months to really see big improvements. It will, and it's almost as if there. Um, a lot of the patients have also got methylation issues with their genes. Their genes aren't super perfect. None of us have got perfect genes. And so we have, you know, certain biochemical processes that are always under a bit of stress. And it's almost as if the coronavirus, the way that it uh, affects our mast cells um, and then our systems puts us under so much pressure that some of these weaknesses really start to um, show and supporting people's systems with some good vitamins and minerals and good nutrition is so important and it helps their bodies to get back into balance I think. So just lastly then what do you hope will start to come out of this the, the evidence that you have and that other people uh, other doctors who are treating people with long COVID will lead to do you hope that you know the government NHS will take notice of this? Well, I would love I would love the NHS long COVID clinics to um, if we if we find that this is right, which I think it probably is, um, then the long COVID clinics um, could do the same kind of treatment for patients. I think it would have a huge impact on um, patients with other inflammatory conditions like ME and IBS and so on, which is all coming from the mast cell. That's that's what we believe anyway, the doctors who treat and see this. Um, and so I think it could be a new dawning really for patients with all those medically unexplained symptoms that were previously sort of um, not treated, could be treated in a way that would make those people help those people get better. So it could put MCAS on the map, it could help the pa patients with fibromyalgia, ME, chronic fatigue, um, uh, and uh, IBS, chronic migraine, urticaria, funny rashes, food intolerances, it could really help us to progress things. It would be fantastic if the long COVID clinics um, did take this approach, I think. Um, and certainly they could do some studies to see if this approach is worth taking, you know, um, they could very easily do that. They're going to have thousands, tens of thousands of patients to um, to talk to and to examine and to to treat. So it would be quite straightforward for them to do a randomized control trial, you know, treat half and not treat the other half and see how they all improve and what happens. Um, so and then those clinics could become centers of excellence for treating MCAS and histamine intolerance and all these patients so they could continue beyond but I suspect long COVID is going to be here for quite some time and uh, yeah so that would be my hope of the silver lining that comes out of all of this but in the first instance we have to help all these patients as best we can.